Let's go to Colossians 2, shall we? Colossians chapter 2. You know, I was thinking about when we sang that uh, last congregational song, not I, but Christ, right? I was thinking, oh, I wish we'd all get that. <laughs> I wish that would sink into all of our minds, hearts, and lives. I wish we would see that Jesus was so much more than just a ticket out of hell. So much more than just a savior from sin. <laughs> he is a deliverer from sin. He's a deliverer from the devil. <laughs> He's a deliverer from death itself. We will all undergo a marvelous bodily resurrection. I hope that if you see anything from Colossians chapter 2, that you come away from it this morning saying, wow, just as the title of that message says, it's true. Jesus is all you need. Jesus is all you need. Someone said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom here this morning, but there are various things that are intersecting at this time, and 2024 may prove in some ways to be the most challenging year that we've ever lived. How are you going to navigate it? I hope you determine right now that you're not going to live in fear of what might happen. How are you going to navigate through all of the anxiety that could build up when you see things shaping up the way they are? Well, I think Colossians chapter 2 reveals the simple truth. You need Jesus for this. Do you have him? Do you possess the Lord Jesus in your life? Have you ever squared things away with him? Have you ever accepted him as the, the one that, and only one, and only thing that can bring peace between you and the God of heaven is Jesus? As we face 2024, we all need to be certain that we have Jesus. You got him? Does he have you? If you have him, he has you. And if you have Jesus, as I said a moment ago, you have everything that you're ever going to need, not only for this year, but for the rest of your life and eternity. So you need Jesus. You young people need to be sure that you have Jesus. We older adults need to be sure that we have Jesus. Because he's everything and he's all you need. I want to pause a moment have a word of prayer, and then look at Colossians 2 together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have the scriptures. And I pray that you would instruct our hearts, Spirit of God. You're the unction. You're the anointing from the Holy One that we so desperately need to give us illumination, understanding. So will you invigorate our understanding by anointing our spiritual minds? And opening our spiritual eyes, opening our spiritual heart, and insert into them what you want us to see, what you want us to realize, what you want us to understand, so that people will walk out of here this, this morning and say, well, Jesus is all I need. I pray, Lord, that you would make that manifest, make that clear. I pray that your presence would be manifest right here in our midst, that there would be a sense of the Spirit of God revealing Jesus as all that we need, like perhaps we've never seen him before. And Lord, if there is anyone that is not sure 
in the sound of my voice that is not sure that they have Jesus or not. May this be the day when that gets settled once and for all. Because to have Jesus is to have him permanently because we are kept by his power through our reliance upon him. Now we pray that you would uh, be exalted and undertake, pray for that unction again for both the listener, but also for the speaker, that you might accomplish what you have in mind and not what we think. We pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. In the first 12 verses, it's very simple. Here's God's plan laid out for you. He has no plan B. You know, we we say, well, if this doesn't work out, we can go to plan B. God has no plan B. He has plan A. And the plan of God is not a thing, but it's a person. And it's Jesus himself. And the reason he has no plan B is because Jesus is enough. I want you to see that as we look in the first couple of verses in the opening of this second chapter. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at uh, Laodicea. Now there were Tri-City, remember? Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And uh, so they shared this letter that Paul is writing to them. And he said, I've never been in your city. Uh, I've not seen, you you haven't seen my face in the flesh. Uh, But I want you to know this, verse 2, I'm writing this, that their hearts, like your hearts, might be comforted. I want the churches that read this letter to have their hearts comforted, encouraged, being knit together in love unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. What is the mystery of God? Now, a mystery in a biblical definition is something that God has not revealed until he chooses to reveal it. A Bible mystery is something that no human mind would ever figure it out. In fact, neither would uh, would uh, the spirit realm ever figure out the mind of God unless he revealed it to them. And so he is saying, I have a mystery. I have something that up to this point I haven't revealed that I'm revealing to you in this letter. And of course, in the, the chapter one, of the book of Colossians, he tells us what that mystery is in the 27th verse. And that secret that has been kept uh, under wrap until Paul reveals it by the Spirit of God is this wonderful truth that rings throughout this, this whole chapter. By the way, in a moment, I'll tell you something else. And that truth, that mystery, that secret that he reveals is Christ is in you. And you know who he is? He's God in a body. And he's in your body. And by the way, if you hang out with the Apostle Paul very much, you're going to find out that he's always talking about that. He's always telling you that it's Christ in you and that you're in Christ. And it's all about Christ and what he can do in and through you. That's all Paul talks about when you read his 13 letters, I think it is, that uh, make up our New Testament. God's plan is Jesus, and he's enough. Now, you remember, there is a heresy that was spreading through that area of the world, and was it was uh, affecting the churches there. And the heresy was known as Gnosticism. It comes from the Greek word meaning to know. And so the Gnostics were teaching that they had a secret knowledge that no one else could tap into. You had to be initiated into this knowledge by them. You had to join their little group. And so Paul is, he is battling that in the letter to the Colossians. The the Gnostic claimed that they had this secret knowledge. And 
what Paul says in the third verse is this. In Christ, in whom, meaning Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's why Jesus is enough. While the Gnostics claimed that they had a secret knowledge, Paul says, you know what? Jesus is enough because all knowledge and wisdom that you'll ever need to live your life is right there in him. Are you seeking knowledge? Do we have any seekers of knowledge here today? I think in one way or another, we all seek knowledge. But are you seeking knowledge in the right place? Because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are secreted in Christ. And as you get to know Christ, he opens up the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God to you. And if you really think about it, all truth and all real knowledge and wisdom has its source in one person, and that's God. And so in Christ, who is God, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are secreted there, are deposited there, are secured there. But with heresies like Gnosticism, and there are modern counterparts of that in the cults today, and even in areas of uh, what we would uh, think as evangelical Christendom, there are uh, uh, branches that, uh, that run very close to what was going on with this heresy. It was risky then, it's risky now. And so in the first five verses, he's really dealing with the riskiness. He's telling us things are risky. I remember reading about a pastor that uh, was concerned about some seedy uh, businesses and really uh, terribly bad influences that uh, were, were springing up around uh, his church and the Christian school that was attached to the church. And so he began to push back against the, the city council and government. And eventually, uh, there was a lawsuit that was, uh, that was filed, and the pastor had to appear in court. And when he was put on the, on the witness stand and cross-examined by the defense attorney, he, uh, he was asked point blank by the defense attorney, you are a pastor, right? Yes. Well, doesn't the word pastor mean shepherd? Yes, it does. Then why aren't you shepherding your people? What are you doing here? And the pastor wisely spoke up and said, because part of being a shepherd is to chase off the wolves that would devour the flock. And that's exactly what Paul's doing here in these opening verses of chapter 5 when he's dealing really with this heresy of Gnosticism. He's talking about the, uh, the risky uh, time that they lived in and that we live in. In fact, four times in this chapter, he warns these believers who would read this letter not to be led astray by false teachers and by false teachings that would pretend to be biblical and it would offer many things. Look at what he says in, in the uh, fourth verse. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Look at verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you or ruin you through philosophy and vain or empty deceitful talk. Uh, look at verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you. Look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you or deceive you of your reward in this voluntary humility, so forth and so on. So four times. There are very wicked forces at work in our world. And uh, they tell us, even in the guise of biblical Christianity, they tell us that we need this and we need that. 
All you need to know and all you need to do are found in Jesus. That's what Paul's telling us in Colossians chapter 2. Because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, verse 3 says, are found in him, are deposited in him. So there's really no other helpful person or philosophy. You must always place your full dependence in Jesus. Look at verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, I'm not with you at the church. Yet I am with you in spirit, and I am joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith. Don't be shoved around spiritually. Don't be pushed from the truth. Uh, stand in full dependence on Jesus. So Jesus is a plan, God's plan, and he's enough, but it's risky out there. But we don't need to fear because he can fully meet whatever is risky. Look at uh, how fully he does that. Verse 6, as you have therefore received Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established or strengthened in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. The secret truth that is revealed in the book of Colossians is that Christ himself resides in you if you're a believer. He's in you. Christ himself. And I want you to note from verse 6 that the Christian life begins and ends, or begins and continues, I, I should say. Initially and continually is a life of faith. It's a God-dependent life from start to finish. Of course, the Christian life never finishes because it's eternal life. So there really is not an ending. But what he's saying in verse 6, the same way that you got saved is the same way that you live the Christian life. Did you struggle to get saved? Was there a list of to-dos that you had to accomplish in order to get saved? Sound biblical teaching regarding salvation is that we do nothing to get saved. That we simply receive by faith that Christ has done it all for us, right? And so we put full dependence. We transfer all dependence from self or a priest or a rabbi or a minister. We transfer all of that dependence to Jesus, and we trust him alone. Well, what Paul says in verse 6 is that's how you live the life too. So walk in him. It is God dependence when you get saved, and it's God dependence throughout your earthly life. Your walk on God's street, if you will, is a walk by faith. It's a God-dependent walk is what we're called to here. And notice this. Look at the agricultural uh, metaphor he uses in verse 7. Rooted. We're rooted. Your spiritual roots are deep in him. And the deeper they go, the stronger you become. Verse 6 or 7 says, uses an architectural metaphor then, built up, edified. We get our word edifice from this word. Built up or edified. Your spiritual roots deep in him will cause you to depend upon him and you'll be spiritually strengthened so much so that you'll be overflowing with thanksgiving, he says in verse 7. You know, thanksgiving is really the mark of a spirit-filled life. Grumbling and murmuring and complaining, that's the mark of a flesh-filled life. Thanksgiving, a spirit-filled life. But what he is saying here is that you're covered in Christ. He's in you, and as a result, you need to drive those roots deep down in him. Remember the parable of the sower and the seed? 
Some of the seed was thrown on ground that was only a shallow covering over bedrock. It immediately, that uh, seed germinated and sprung up, but when the hot sun hit it, it withered and died because the roots couldn't penetrate the bedrock. It was shallow in its root system. You're going to send your spiritual roots down deep in Jesus. That's why I'm saying, seek him. Seek him. Make him your focal point in life. Nothing else. Young people, don't make education your focal point. <laughs> don't get to sidetracked by your studies and lose your focus on Jesus. Don't let your career or your job be your focal point and distract you from being focused on what you need to be most deeply rooted in. Otherwise, nothing that you will do will be of any eternal value, nor will be successful in the eyes of God. So this is what he says. This is risky, what the times we live in, but it's all right because it's fully covered in Jesus. And then in verses 8 to 12, as we consider God's plan, which is Jesus, we see that in him we have liberty. Look at verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through human philosophy, human thinking. By the way, not all philosophy is bad. Some of it has its roots in God, right, is truth. But a lot of philosophy is just human thinking, and uh, that doesn't get it. That does, that's of no real value. Human thinking, philosophy, and vain or empty, deceitful. It sounds good, but it's really nonsense. It's what I call gobbledygook. It's meaningless. Sounds spiritual, baby. Sounds biblical. Sounds Christian. That There's a lot of that stuff out there on YouTube. There's a lot of that stuff out there on the internet. So be careful of where we get our knowledge and wisdom from. He says, beware. So I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Beware. Just because it says Christian doesn't mean it is. Beware. And then he says, after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ, beware of false teaching. It's all around us. Beware of falsehood. It, it's, it's, the, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing. It's dressed up as truth, but it's not. It might have some truth that it's dressed up in, but when you strip it, you'll find it's not really truth. It's falsehood, and it's deceptive. It, it claims to be biblical. And it's uh, it, notice he says uh, that it's, it, it can take you captive as well. Uh, he he warns in these in this chapter about being taken captive by this stuff. Captivated. It, it sounds logical. It appeals to human logic, and so it's captivating. But he, it, it, God's plan is not human philosophy. God's plan is not what is called here in verse eight the rudiments of the world. You know what that really refers to? The rudiments are the evil spirits that influence human thinking in this world. Peter calls it the doctrine of demons, demonic doctrines or demonic teachings that has, that influences and and uh, and infiltrates Christian teaching. So he says, beware of the evil spirits that are behind this teaching. And these evil, the rudiments of this world, these evil spirits were believed to influence the heavenly bodies. And so it was kind of a mixture of religious astrology. And they believed that as a result, human life was influenced by them. That, I think, uh, is what connects with verse 16. 
about uh, new moons and, uh, and holy days, how human life is affected by, the, by astrology. So he says, beware, God's plan isn't this stuff. It's a person. Get to know Jesus because look at what he says in verse 9. He's God in a human body. Now, may I remind you, the Gnostics believed that all matter was evil. Anything that you could touch, anything that was tangible was evil. Thus, the human body in their mind was evil. And so they came up with a system of, uh, of spirits that emanated from God so that God, who is holy, wouldn't be contaminated by matter. So the God would have nothing to do with his creation because it was contaminated. That's what they taught. And so this blows their philosophy right out of the water because here comes God in a human body. Here comes God in matter. Here comes God in a tangible human body. And that's what the verse 9 is really throwing in their face. You're in him. You're in God, and, uh, and God is in Christ. You're in Christ, and, and God is in Christ because in Christ is all the fullness of God in a human body. It's amazing. We just came through uh, Christmas time, which is supposed to be uh, a celebration of the first coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus. He comes. This is how he got his human body, right? This is God in a human body. This is what's happening here. All the fullness of God is in Jesus, in his humanity. That's what verse 9 says. And then verse 10 says, and you, if you're a believer, you're complete in him, in Jesus, which is the head of all principality and power. All the fullness of God is in Jesus. And you're in Jesus, so all the fullness of God is in you. Isn't that mind-boggling to think about? What he's saying is, you are made to permanently experience Jesus' fullness in your life every day. Have you experienced that lately? This is why I constantly say, you need a personal experiential relationship with the Lord. You need a personal encounter with the Lord on a regular basis because you are made to permanently experience Jesus' fullness in your human body. That's important. Jesus is all you need. In fact, in that 10th verse, we've always uh, thought about the fact that Jesus is the head of the body, meaning the church, all believers, right? But in verse 10, he's said to be the head of all the heavenly hosts. He's the head of all principalities and powers. He is the creator of them, just as, as he is of us. And he is the ruler over them. Well, that's a good thought. Because thus, they don't really, they don't really rule things. He does. In fact, he's dealt with sin and evil spirits at the cross. We're going to see that in just a moment. But the fact that I want you to see now the truth of Jesus in you that is so pertinent and so important. I hope if you're if you're distracted now that you tune in, okay? Time to tune in. Turn the dial. Push the button, whatever. Tune in. Wake up. This is this is. This is vital truth. And it's verse 11 and 12. In whom? That's in Jesus. Also, you are circumcised, not physically, because it's made without hands. It's a circumcision without hands, which means it's a spiritual circumcision. What kind of spiritual circumcision? He says, and the putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ is a circumciser, spiritually. He circumcises us 
by his spirit, of course. What does that mean? That is simply Romans 6 truth in different words. You remember what we learned in Romans 6? He says, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into, into his death. Now, don't let that word baptism throw you. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that water baptism is just a picture of. He says, when you got saved, baptism means to immerse or to plunge under. When you got saved, you were immersed into Jesus. And as a result, you are totally identified with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So that verse 6 of Romans 6 says, you need to know that because you're a believer, your old man, that is that old unregenerate spirit that you used to be, is crucified with him, that the body of sin, that this human body that uh, would normally be the vehicle, the turf through which sin would be uh, uh, lived out, might be destroyed or put out of business. That you should henceforth not slave for sin. That's what he's saying in verse 11 when he talks about the circumcision that uh, Jesus performs in us. He is saying this, that when if you are born again, you're in Christ, baptized in him, plunged, immersed in him, but he is plunged, immersed in you. And when Jesus immersed you in him, and the Spirit, uh, uh, and he immersed uh, himself in you, when that happened, as a believer, you were permanently severed from indwelling sin. Prior to, Romans 6 tells us, indwelling sin is like, is like personified in that chapter. He's like a slave master. Indwelling sin, you were completely joined to it before salvation. And at salvation, your union with indwelling sin has been permanently severed. Doesn't mean that indwelling sin doesn't exist anymore in you. It simply means that you're no longer in union with it. You're no longer joined to it. But instead, you've been severed from sin, and you have now been joined to a new partner. And that new partner is Jesus. Buried with him in baptism, verse 12, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So you have been severed from indwelling sin, and you have been permanently joined to Christ, and that has liberated you and set you free from the world. You're crucified under the world and the world to you. And you have been set free and liberated also from evil spirits as well. And you now have the power, the living Christ and the power of the risen Christ in you. Your body's not evil, but your body can be a vehicle for sin. It's the vehicle for sin. Okay, your body is the turf where sin is lived out, is played out. But what he's saying, Christ within you can make your body, instead of a vehicle for sin, a means of pleasing God. Isn't that a wonderful hope? You don't have to do what your body wants you to do, which is which may be sinful. You can say no to indwelling sin because it's no longer your master. You're no longer in union with it. That relationship has permanently been severed. You're in union with Christ. And so as a result, your body no longer needs to be a vehicle for sin. It can now be a, a vehicle for pleasing God. But the choice is really yours. Because as a believer, even though you're permanently severed from indwelling sin, you can choose to serve it but it can't make you like it used to. It can't make you. You're not its slave. You do so at your own free will to do so. 
So that's the wonderful truth that I wanted you to wake up and hear. That's God's plan. That's why I'm saying, Lord, please show us that there's so much more to Jesus than just an escape route from hell. There's power. This, this is a wonderful plan, and it's, and it's operational. <laughs> Look at uh, what he says in verse 12. It's, it's activated through your personal dependence on God. The faith of the operation of God. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to access this power. You have to activate God's plan, and it becomes power in your life. Now, Gnosticism, this heresy that he's dealing with here, was a mixture. It was a syncretism of different philosophies. Um, Eastern mysticism, uh, astrology, philosophy, and even uh, uh, legal legalistic Judaism. It was all mixed up. But what Paul's saying here is, hey, you don't need that stuff. All you need is Jesus. And I try to make it simple for myself, and I hope then for other people, by just, just focus on Jesus. If he's your focus, you know what? Everything else seems to fall into place. Everything else will work it out. Just make Jesus your focus. And that's what he's saying. He, he's all that you need. He will. He, he's the procedure, and he's also the, the one that supplies the provision. Look at the victory that he's given us, verses 13 to 15. And you, you believer, then this includes you. You were once dead in your sins. By that, it means that uh, you simply had no choice. You had to do what indwelling sin commanded you to do, but you're no longer like that. You're now risen with Christ. You've been liberated. But notice what he says. You, in the past, were dead in sin, in the uncircumcision of, before you were before you were severed permanently from indwelling sin, the uncircumcision of your flesh. But he's quickened you together with Christ, having forgiven all your trespasses. What are you worried about? All your sins are forgiven when you come to Christ. That not only means your past sins, but it also means your present and future sins. They're all covered already. They're already forgiven. Does that mean then I can just go and sin all I want? That's not the heart of a believer. That's a total misunderstanding. But you have been forgiven. Notice what he says here, all your trespasses. That trespasses are sins where you sinned against God. So look at the victory here. The procedure that Jesus performed was called spiritual circumcision. We've looked at that in verses 11 and 12. Well, that spiritual circumcision, that procedure leads to a provision that gives us victory. Jesus paid our sin debt on that cross. He paid the sin debt in full. And as a result, notice what else happened. Verse 14. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That handwriting of ordinances, listen to this note in, in the footnotes of my Ryrie Study Bible. A handwriting of ordinances, a certificate or an acknowledgement of debt in the handwriting of the debtor. And then he says this, the law of Moses put us in debt to God with sin, and this debt has been canceled because Jesus nailed it to the cross, having made full payment. You remember there was a sign nailed to the cross? This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Well, there was also spiritually nailed to that cross all the handwriting of ordinances, all the, as he says here, 
that certificate or acknowledgement of debt as you, the sin debtor, was nailed to Jesus' cross. And by his death on that cross, he completely wiped it out. So the victory here is that you are liberated from violating the law of God. You're forgiven because that payment for violating God's law has been paid in your place by Jesus. And not only that, look at verse 15. He's done more for us. And having spoiled, literally disarmed, principalities and powers, that's a code phrase for the heavenly hosts that are evil, evil spirits, he made a show of them openly. He disgraced them, triumphing over them in it. He conquered on the cross the evil spirit unseen realm, which means he gives us victory over our spiritual enemies. He disarmed them. He made a spectacle of them. He defeated them, and he disgraced them. It's as if he paraded Satan and all the rebellious, evil, heavenly hosts as defeated behind him as the king and the conqueror. That's the power that we have here that gets activated from God's plan, God's power. It's a power that gives victory. And, and this is reality. You know, all those gifts you got, that's not reality. You know, all that stuff you have, it's not reality. You know, this life uh, that uh, the world thinks so much of, it's not reality. Don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world, because it's not reality. What is reality? Look at verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a, a holy day. That's where we get our word holiday from, holy day, holiday. <clears throat> or new moon or Sabbath days. This is, again, that aspect of Gnosticism that included uh, Jewish legalism, which are just, he says, notice verse 17, they're all a shadow of things to come. But the body, the tangible, is Christ. So don't let any man lead you astray. Don't let any man deceive you, verse 18, beguile you of your reward in the voluntary, in the voluntary humility and worshiping of angels or worshiping with angels, whichever. Intruding into those things which they haven't seen. It's the unseen realm. And they're vainly uh, puffed up their it's empty conceit that they've come up with in their human thinking and they don't hold the head which is Jesus who is the head of the body who is the only one that holds the body of Christ or the church together and nourishes it and uh, causes it to increase more and more so here's the point Jesus is the reality He's all you need. Have you heard that before? Jesus is all you need. Everything else is just a shadow. You know, this earthly life minus Jesus, it's a shadow. This isn't real life. Without Jesus, it's not real life. Doesn't matter how much you have in your bank account. That's not real life. Doesn't matter how high up you are on the so-called totem pole. It's not real life. It's just a shadow. Jesus is the reality. doesn't matter what your grade point average is in, in, without Christ. It's a shadow. Christ is the reality in our lives. And he dwells, if you're a believer, he dwells in you. Never gonna, he's never going to move out. And you always have him. But here's the key. Because he's the reality. That doesn't mean that he's a reality to you automatically. You have to believe that he's a reality, and you have to draw upon him and, and uh, practically experience that in him is the wisdom, the love, the power, the fullness that you need in your life. Draw upon him. He's the reality. There's where the power is. 
in victory, reality, and one third and final thing. In verses 20 to 23, it's all about identity. Look at what he says. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances, such as taste not, touch not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using? They're not reality. After the commandments and doctrines or teachings of men, which have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship, but it shows you have a good, strong will if you follow asceticism, denying yourself, and humility, and neglecting your bodily desires, but it doesn't help you to conquer your flesh. It doesn't help you to conquer sin in your life. What helps? What's the answer? Your identity in Christ. Jesus is the power to conquer any evil desires that we have within us. And we all have our evil desires. They might be different. Some ways they might be the same. But we all have evil desires in our hearts. And you can't simply squelch them. You can for a little while. You can to a certain degree. And, you know, it's commendable when you see people like, you know, there, there's people that uh, I know that they smoked for 40 years. And all of a sudden they had a heart attack. And that day they stopped smoking and they never smoked again. I mean, obviously they shouldn't have smoked. They shouldn't have, uh, They probably wouldn't have had a heart attack had they stopped earlier. But they will, by their human will. They stopped it on the on the spot. Well, that doesn't work. Evil desires aren't conquered. Those evil desires that are within us are not conquered by simply making up our minds. It's only in your dying with Christ that you're set free from the world and its evil spiritual powers, is what he's saying in verse 20. Legalism can't sanctify the human heart. You know why? Because legalism doesn't touch the heart. It can't change the heart. You can follow a whole list of 613 commandments. You can follow the Ten Commandments. But it doesn't cut it. It doesn't work. Because it doesn't change the heart. Rules equal self-effort. And self-effort never equals victory. Rules, such as following the law, actually stirs up evil desires within us. Did you know that? That's what Paul says. Listen to what he says here. When he's struggling, when he, before he got to Romans 8 and found Christ's spirit to be the answer, Paul says this in Romans 7. Is the law sin? No, God forbid. I wouldn't have even known what sin was. I wouldn't know how to define it if it would not be for God's law. I wouldn't know what lust was, except the law would say, thou shalt not covet, which means don't lust, whatever that lust might be for. And then he says this. But sin, sin. That indwelling sin that's personified in chapter 6. Sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of lust. For without the law, sin was dead. And what he's simply saying is that the law is not sinful in and of itself, but the law arouses lust in me. See the sign? Don't walk on the grass. What are you tempted to do? <laughs> See the sign? Do not touch wet paint. What are you tempted to do? That's just a, a little picture of what the law does inwardly. It stirs up lust. When God says don't, our, our bent as humans is to do the opposite of what God says don't. And so rules actually incite us to sin, and self-effort 
ultimately always leads to frustration and defeat. And that's where some of you are living day in and day out, and yet you're saved. Because you're following rules, and you're going by self-effort and the exercise merely of your human will. And you're failing. And you're sitting here today, and you're thinking, I'm going to face another year just like I did this past year. But I'm saying to you, you don't have to because Jesus is all you need. And he can make that difference. I read about a jet truck called the Shockwave that runs over 300 miles an hour. It actually races airplanes at air shows. And the Shockwave holds the record in the quarter mile for trucks at 256 miles an hour in just 6.36 seconds. It holds the world record for full-size trucks at 376 miles an hour, as recorded by the Guinness Book of World Records. It has 36,000 horsepower, and the shockwave has enough power to accelerate at 3 Gs vertical, which is as much as the space shuttle had. The living, resurrected Christ in you is more than enough power to spare for all the issues that you'll ever face in 2024 or the rest of your life. In fact, in the same way that the 36,000 horsepower shockwave truck is more than enough to propel that truck on land, Jesus' power in you is more than sufficient to enable you and every single believer that is living to live a mighty, powerful, transformed life. That's what Colossians 2 is about. And I'll say it one last time. Jesus is all you need. Don't fool yourself into thinking you need anything else or anyone else. You can make it with him.